I was once told by a wise person that you should never agree to give a talk if you're in the last session of the last day. Yeah. And you should never go to a meeting in Las Vegas in July. Yeah. So that, <laughs> My name is John Garrick. I'm not a chemist or a chemical engineer or a materials scientist or a nurse scientist or a policy analyst. So why am I here? <clears throat> well, one reason I'm here is because I was invited by Ray Weimer. And I always like to go to a meeting with Ray Weimer because it gives me the comfort of not being the oldest one in the room. <laughs> uh, but I am pleased to be here. And uh, I hope I have a few remarks that are of interest to the group. <clears throat> I want to acknowledge my co-author. Bill Geckler, I decided to at least bring a chemical engineer into the process of developing this paper. Bill is, a, is an outstanding chemical engineer, particularly from the point of view of uh, doing uh, safety type investigations. I intend to cover three topics. Uh, one is uh, a little bit about the QRA methodology, and the second is uh, uh, and uh, the presentations have helped in this regard. Uh, something about the nuclear safety experience in the, in the chemical pro reprocessing field. And then uh, a few uh, ideas about how you would build a model for a reprocessing plant, a risk model. Uh, the real reason I'm here is uh, because of a lot of experience we've had with respect to analyzing the risk of all manner of facilities. The methodology I'm going to share with you today, some of you are very familiar with it, uh, has evolved over the last four decades. Uh, our goal, the goal of basically the team that I've been associated with throughout my career, has to allow it to evolve to a general theory a theory of risk assessment that can be applied to any kind of problem. And while the boundary conditions are very different and the phenomenological issues are very different, and therefore the risk team should be made up differently for each application, there are certain principles, certain process steps that have surfaced that seem to work well, whether it's a a uh, nuclear power plant, which is where we've had most of our experience, a nuclear waste facility, which we've had quite a bit of recent experience, a chemical plant, uh, analyzing such far out things as uh, uh, the import, the risk of importing certain animal species into an, a, a, a population where that species doesn't exist, uh, even did risk uh, assessment in a cost-benefit trade-off of such transportation issues as the uh, cost-benefit of going from special trains to regular trains. And uh, some uh, 50 or 60 nuclear power plants around the world. And so obviously you'd think that it would stabilize, and I think it probably pretty much has. And this is what I plan to do today. Uh, when I say it has sort of stabilized, it's kind of stabilized at the high level, at the process uh, step. And what seems to be work each time is the imp implementation of some six uh, uh, basic steps. And, uh, uh, and, and so our goal, our hope of this evolving to a general theory seems to be coming into uh, fruition. First thing you have to do, of course, is understand the system that you're dealing with. And, and, what, and the biggest challenge of that in many instances is quantifying, if you wish, the success states of that system. And if it's a complex system, it gets particularly uh, challenging. Uh, uh, but you certainly need to know uh, what uh, represents an upset of any, of any system. And so any departure from what you might define as a successful system 
is what you want to be able to expose. Number two, identify and characterize the sources of danger. We've done risk assessments where uh, the risk measure was a uh, toxic chemical or an explosion or injuries or fatalities uh, for almost or disease or almost any uh, uh, thing that uh, was of particular interest to whomever we were doing the risk assessment for. Uh, in this case, it's very easy. We're talking about radiation. Uh, develop what can go wrong scenarios and damage states. Uh, the, the methodology that I'm talking about is sometimes been referred to as uh, the scenario-based approach to risk assessment. And so the cornerstone of the whole analysis is to uh, develop the scenarios that represent as complete a set as you can develop uh, of the things that can go wrong with the system. And then the mathematical part, the development of the scenarios being the uh, creative part, the mathematical part is the quantification of the likelihoods of the scenarios and the end states of the scenarios are the damage states. So when you quantify the scenarios, you quantify the damage states. And then even after you have uh, the likelihoods of individual scenarios, which is an uh, enormous amount of material, especially in the case of some complex facilities. And the number of scenarios may vary from a few to millions, uh, just depending on how the model proceeds and how you've designed the, the risk measure that you want to uh, compute and the level of detail you want with respect to uh, the components and systems. Uh, of what you're analyzing. And then, uh, so you need to assemble, have a means of assembling those scenarios into a, an integrated or complete statement of, of risk. And you want to do it in such a way that you can backtrack and uh, provide some very important outputs with respect to risk management. Such outputs as the uh, relative contribution of uh, of uh, uh, th uh, um, issues that are contributing to the risk. Uh, so the cornerstone of the process is, uh, are these break uh, basic principles. And one thing I'd like to point out is that, of course, the reactor safety study represented a turning point in the way we think about nuclear safety. But most of the internals of this methodology uh, were developed in the private sector. Uh, the first big boost we got of, of my company many years ago was we dominated the uh, risk assessment business in the nuclear power field. Uh, our little team, and it was a little team, and we had about 150 employees total. Uh, we uh, were responsible for something like 45 U.S. plants another 10, 15 international plants. And we just couldn't, uh, almost couldn't keep up with the business during the 70s and the 80s. And then when the NRC got in the business, things changed a little bit. Because our whole thrust was to what we called full scope risk assessments. We indeed wanted to quantify the health effects. And uh, while there was lots of grumbling and grousing in the business about the inadequacies of the uh, models, particularly the health effects models. Uh, with what we had uh, uh, done with respect to uncertainty modeling, we felt confident that uh, the amount of information we could get uh, would be e enormously beneficial. So this is what uh, is the backbone of the approach. The triplet definition of risk, uh, this started in my PhD thesis which was really given uh, substance uh, in 1981 uh, with my uh, colleague, Stan Kaplan, who, by the way, just passed away from Alzheimer's disease. Uh, when we published the first paper in the first journal, uh, in the Journal of Risk Analysis, uh, which was by that definition, a quantitative definition of risk. Uh, scenarios. Scenarios is, are the foundation, 
uh, cradle to grave scenarios from initiating events <clears throat> to uh, damaged states, or if you wish, from initial conditions to damaged states. Uh, and then the thing that we spent the most uh, uh, analytical energy on was our uncertainty models. We were really the first to put uncertainty in our fundamental risk models, as not, an, not as an afterthought, but as an uh, inherent uh, feature of the modeling process. And then we did something else. We adopted what I would call an engineer's definition of probability, not a classical definition, not a frequency limiting de definition, but a definition that was very simple, but enormously helpful. And that was that we even considered the idea of not, of not using the word probability, but rather using the word credibility. But we decided we'd leave it as probability. And that definition, of course, is, is just simply uh, the credibility of a hypothesis based on the supporting evidence in the form of a number from zero to one. And then since uh, Bayes' theorem embodies the fundamental rules of logic and plausible reasoning, we became very Bayesian and had to be sure that all of our probabilities obeyed uh, Bayes' theorem. So this was the, this was the the process. Now, <clears throat> what do we mean when we talk about the triplet definition of risk? Well, that could be a short course in itself, and it has been in the past at MIT and at, at UCLA and other places. But at a high level, this is what it's all about. When we ask the question, what is the risk, we're really asking three questions. And they are, what can go wrong with our system? And the system can be a natural system or it can be an engineered system, or it can be a, a social system. And we, if something does go wrong, how likely is it? And, of course, what are the consequences? Now, there's been a tendency over the years, as people have referenced this paper or this approach, to want to add other bullets. For example, another bullet that you'll see in, in the literature is what are the uncertainties? Well, that's embodied in the second bullet in how you define your likelihood function. We always include uncertainty. And they also add the, the bullet sometimes uh, take corrective action. Well, that's not a risk assessment action. That's a risk management action. So we tried to keep it very clean, very compact, and built the, the analytical infrastructure around that. And uh, so this is, uh, this is our notation that we've adopted for what we mean by, by risk. The inner brackets really enclosing the triplet, the outer brackets implying the set of, and the subscript C implying the complete set of. Now, of course, you don't always find the complete set, uh, but we found that we can have very good luck at getting the most mostly important ones. So let's go into it a little bit and just ask ourselves, what, are we, what process do we go through to structure the scenarios? Uh, and it really, the, the six steps that I outlined for you tend to collapse into three major analytical activities. The first one is the middle one, understanding what the system is. And of course, uh, something we learned very early was that the more you can linearize the system, the better off you are, such that in, an a, in a system that's A, B, C, two, or, a, or one, two, three, four, that uh, one leads to two, leads to three, and so forth. In other words, when you try to cast the system, whether it's a natural system or an engineered system, into what the mathematicians might call a, lin a linear vector space. And you want to do that because it gives you the whole arsenal of matrix mathematics at your disposal. And that becomes enormously beneficial, which you can't do if your risk assessment is just fault trees, because a fault tree space is not a linear vector space. But an inventory is a linear vector space. 
And so you would like to have your model such that uh, you structured it in a, war, in a way that you can define the output states in each, from each of those boxes. For example, in the nuclear power plant case, we had the, uh, we had the plant model, and we had the containment model, and we had the site model. So the end states of the plant model were plant damage states. The end states of the containment model were the release categories. And the end states of the site model were the, was the dose ranges. So uh, that uh, is where a lot of the risk assessments fall down, is that they have not uh, taken the time that's needed to characterize uh, just exactly what the system is. And the part, the, the part of it that's often neglected is the part of it that turned out in the nuclear power case to be the most important, and that is the support systems. The, uh, the, the one that's sometimes the most difficult, especially if it happens to be a terrorism risk problem, is the threat assessment. Uh, we, we sort of have adopted a kind of a master logic diagram. It takes the form of a, of, of a fault tree uh, as, as a, where the top event is the initiating event, or an event that could just disturb the system at any uh, uh, part of the system. And the kind of information that you require in that is not just things like failure rates and so forth. It's whatever information seems to be relevant to uh, leading to a threat uh, to your system at any point along uh, the sequence of the system. Um, the most uh, developed part of it, in many respects, is the vulnerability assessment. Uh, and uh, the, the, this is where we, now we have the, the initiating condition or the initiating event, and, uh, but we know that that initiating event is, the, the, the facility is usually designed to intervene with the continued pathway of that initiating event, and corrective actions are built into the system. The ABC, et cetera, uh, are the, so-called intervening events or the top events, and you need to uh, incorporate them in, in the uh, whole structuring of the scenario process. <clears throat> so what kind of th threats do we consider? Well, I think everybody's very familiar with that, and I'm not going to uh, spend much time on it. But there are uh, two types of threats we worry about, uh, and they are the Internal, that is the threats that come from the facility uh, itself, and external. Um, some are common to both. You can have a fire internally initiated, and you can have a fire externally. Uh, but these, you don't put limits on this. And every location, uh, this list is different. Uh, and uh, of course, you've got to also, as we have very much aware from the Fukushima event, to worry about collateral events, such as uh, tsunamis from earthquakes and what have you, or tsunamis from asteroid impacts, is one of the big, is a big issue on the coastal cities. Uh, now we categorize these threats into two broad uh, groups, and this is, uh, this was done extremely well in the uh, Yucca Mountain performance assessment. Uh, but we like to define uh, disruptive events and nominal events and processes. Now, by disruptive, we mean something that happens that can cause a significant change in a very, with a very short time constant. And uh, that is the usual uh, expected, expected events, such as severe storms, tornadoes. We just did a risk assessment of a uh, radioactive waste disposal system in West Valley, New York, and uh, it was quite amazing the number of things that uh, were unique to that site. And that's always the case, whether you have a high-pressure gas line uh, traveling through the site, or whether it's in the path approach pattern of a military base, or what have you. Uh, nominal events are kind of what you expect to happen with respect to the facility 
These are usually aging effects, de uh, de degradation effects. But very often you can uh, develop a, uh, a, an expression or, uh, that represents uh, the, their rates. Sometimes it's constant and sometimes it's, it's not. So, uh, what about probability? It's a very controversial topic, but uh, uh, it, on the other hand, I don't understand why, because it, it's, uh, it's, everything has a probability associated with it. And uh, as I said earlier, what we, mean, what we took to be a, the meaning of probability was actually a, an extension of the famous professor at Stanford and Washington University, St. Louis, uh, Ed James. Uh, and in fact, he's one of the reasons I got interested in this business is that uh, my colleague and I, Stan Kaplan, attended a short course at UCLA put on by James and Myron Tribus. And it was just a great experience. Uh, because here was a, a genius with respect to the Boltzmann equation, which is, was the cornerstone of my uh, early work, uh, saying that uh, most of the way people look at probability is not very productive. And he sparked, uh, 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 really, uh, a long-term relationship and uh, what I would say a major contribution to what we're now tabbing as a general theory of QRA or PRA. And by the way, I, I take QRA and PRA to be the same thing, a quantitative risk assessment and probabilistic risk assessment. Bayes' theorem answers the question, how does the probability of a given hypothesis change with new information? Very powerful, very simple theorem, one that can be derived in two steps and probably one of the most profound uh, probability uh, theorems that exists. And uh, it's really is the cornerstone of any risk assessment that attempts to quantify uncertainties. Okay, that's all I'll say for the moment about the methodology. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the safety experience of nuclear fuel recycling plants. And I'm not going to talk much about this because you've had a pretty good dose of this in the last couple of days. But we know that there are no operating plants in the U.S., although there might be an argument that the H. Canyon at Savannah River is still doing useful processing. And uh, uh, let's hope, uh, hope it is and hope it continues. There are plants in France, United Kingdom, Japan, and Russia. No, many of them are having problems and issues, and some of them are not, not even running right now. Uh, I guess the one that's the most successful is in Le Hague in France. Uh, certainly it has uh, by far uh, the most experience. And uh, as far as uh, recycling plant incidents, uh, is uh, all of the plants, whether they're the government plants or, or the private plant in West Valley, are the plants in the UK and China, uh, uh, France and, and Japan. And there are some plants in India, but nobody seems to know much about those. Uh, at least I don't. And I couldn't get the kind of information that was uh, needed to really make any kind of assessment of them. Uh, but all of the plants, as indicated in that third bullet, experienced uh, leaks and spills and releases and fires and resin fires and all kinds of little events. Uh, as far as I know, uh, none of them were catastrophic. None of them resulted in a, a fatalities. Uh, the, there's two outstanding criticality events, and one in uh, Tomsk, uh, Russia, and the other one in uh, Takamura, Tokamura, Japan. Uh, but, and they both involve the same mistake of moving uh, safe, unsafe material from uh, a safe geometry to an unsafe geometry. And uh, in the case of the Japan, there were two people killed uh, in, the, uh, in the accident. Perhaps the most de uh, devastating one, it was the waste tank explosion in Russia. 
And this was a case where the cooling system for the waste tank was not in operation. It was very high level waste, a lot of heat being generated, and it, it eventually dried itself out and it's basically ended up being ammonia, uh, ammonia nitrate and uh, acetates and eventually exploded. Uh, and that explosion lifted the tank uh, from a bur buried condition and uh, c caused what uh, some uh, media reported as lots of uh, fatalities, but they were latent fatalities. Uh, there were, it's very fuzzy on just, just whether or not there was any acute fatalities. Uh, but in the nearby, the nearby communities did suffer uh, from that event. The most high-profile uh, event are the red oil incidents, and there were a lot of those. Uh, uh, I don't think there would be in a new plant. I think that we'd be using deluents and other methods to keep the temperature and the pressure under control, uh, but we had them at uh, Hanford, Savannah River, two at Savannah River, Oak Ridge we had one, Canada, and Russia. Uh, and so these are the main things that uh, seem, to, seem to have happened in the reprocessing field. So let me go back to my original uh, uh, job of, of telling you how you might address this on a system, on a step-by-step -step basis. So this is the third part of my talk. Uh, so the first thing we say you, you should do is uh, define the system. And uh, we always spent maybe more time on this part than any other part, except in, in, in developing the uh, scenarios. But unless you did this right, uh, you weren't uh, developing, uh, you weren't going to have much success in developing the scenarios. Uh, uh, so how do you go about defining the system? Well, you uh, do a lot of things. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to walk you through, for example, a typical Purex plant flow sheet because you've, done, you've had that. I think uh, Jubin, Bob Jubin covered this the other day. Uh, but uh, ex except to point out that the process flow diagrams in a much greater detail than this are critically important uh, to uh, understanding the system. But there are other things that are just as important. And one of the things we found that's probably the most important data source it was something we were denied in the early, early days, and that was maintenance data. Uh, it is amazing what you can learn uh, from the maintenance data about the performance of your, your plant. But maintenance data, or uh, operating procedures are absolutely critical, uh, and being able to think out of the box uh, one of the things I learned as, as a director of a risk assessment team of over two or three decades was that uh, you got to think out of the box in the creation of the scenarios. And generally, I didn't have much luck with people we hired that had a lot of licensing experience because they kept trying to think within the box of licensing. And that's not what we wanted. Uh, and you really, you really want to think as fundamentally as you can about what can go wrong with uh, whatever it is you're analyzing. And uh, uh, the other thing that uh, we found that was critically important that was not uh, analyzed in a lot of detail in the early reactor days, and that was support systems. And in the case of a reprocessing plant, uh, you have uh, a lot of uh, support systems. You have off-gas systems. You have uh, high-level waste systems. You have acid recovery systems. You have cleanup systems. You have solvent recovery systems. Uh, you have process, and the usual process systems like process, instrument air, steam, uh, electricity, and what have you. And those, is, you really need to look in the dark corners of those to have any great comfort that you have been comprehensive in your, in your analysis. This was the biggest uh, uh, 
lesson learned probably in the nuclear plants because everybody was kind of married to the uh, design-based accident concept, uh, the guillotine brake concept. And so what led to Three Mile Island? A simple relief valve and not good knowledge about the disposition of that relief valve at all times and the support systems. Uh, what led to a lot of other accidents was the failure of the chilled water system in the uh, uh, separate and independent chains, uh, a system that you can go back to the early uh, reactor safety studies and you'll see it never mentioned. So uh, these are the things that can trigger things that can, can cascade, and that's why the scenario of thought process is so, so valuable. <laughs> One thing I forgot to mention, uh, I said I was none, not any of the disciplines that seemed to be relevant to reprocessing. Uh, I was a little bit uh, maybe short change there. I had an experience with reprocessing that I don't think anybody in this room had. And uh, I was on the startup team, and now I'm revealing my age. Uh, I was on the startup team for the Idaho Chemical Reprocessing Plant. But I wasn't hired for, the, for process work. I was hired <clears throat> to worry about the physics problems associated with that plant, and namely, mostly criticality. And it was the first, we put, put together the first criticality team uh, up for the site, and, the, and we not only had the criticality concerns about the plant, the, the chemical plant, but the reactors, and we even interacted with the Navy people, uh, and certainly the EBR uh, people. Uh, it was an exciting time, because everything we did was the first time. And, uh, in, when we put the product of the plant through its first paces uh, uh, from a radioactive standpoint, it turned out that the product was hotter than hell. And uh, what do we do about that? Because nothing seemed to come out the way it was supposed to. Well, they put together a team of about six of us and uh, said, fix it. We, and, and I don't think this is what you could do today. So we kind of slept with this uh, system for about 12 weeks. First, we had to develop what the culprit was. I think Ray will know what that is. We uh, discovered that for some reason or another, we weren't scrubbing out a couple of the key fission products, one of which was uh, ruthenium, ruthenium 106. And so we, we simultaneously were doing distribution coefficient studies and uh, height of transfer unit studies and all these chemical engineering exercises that I was learning as a very, very young uh, and green uh, and, uh, scientist. And, uh, uh, but we did put a team together that uh, came up with a, a tail end process based on uh, precipitating out the, uh, uh, the ruthenium with uh, an H2S uh, process, H2S based process, although we had to use a cupric ion to make sure that the precipitation actually took place. And we cleaned up the product. And we built, we built, we, we developed, designed, built, and processed that product in a period of about seven weeks. And that was a great, great experience. Uh, and uh, we don't see a whole lot of that kind of activity uh, these days. But anyway, this is just to tell you when you design, when you uh, are trying to define the plant, that uh, you, you really need to spend the time that's necessary to do it. Uh, and in most cases, our risk assessments were pretty expensive as a result of that. I remember meeting with the CEO of, of uh, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric. And he says, we want you to do a PRA of Diablo Canyon, but we don't want you to bother any of our staff. And I had the guts uh, to stand up and say, well, and you don't want us. Uh, we have to involve the senior reactor operators in the process. They know the plant better than anybody. And just like uh, uh, at NASA, uh, they, asked, uh, they asked us to do a special study that on the space shuttle and later on, on, on the space station. And uh, I kept getting these presentations from people 
And I said, how come I don't see more uh, emphasis on the scenarios of what can go wrong? And they said, oh, that's somebody else's problem. And so uh, they invited me to attend a training session of the astronauts. And here they were going all through these scenarios. This is what structure can do for you uh, in terms of being an obstacle. And I, and I went back to the safety people. I said, why aren't you doing what they're doing? Why aren't you analyzing each of those scenarios? I said, well, that's not our, what was the word? It's not the, our requirement or some such thing. So anyway, I switched from working with the safety people to working with the astronauts. And that was a great experience because uh, they thought the way we were thinking in terms of the shuttle and how it could perform. And we were looking particularly at the auxiliary power units uh, because uh, the auxiliary power units in the space shuttle are not auxiliary at all. They are absolutely essential. You have to have them for every operation on the shuttle from thrusting the main engine uh, to all the control surfaces to deploying the landing gear, to you name it. So that became pretty exciting because I'd be, our little team would be working on a scenario. We'd call up and we now had some actual scenario con or, or astronaut contact. And they'd say, oh, I need more flying time. I'm coming out and work with you for a couple hours. And that was a great experience. And we built uh, a kind of a, a first of a kind model on the risk of losing a shuttle as a result of failure of the auxiliary power unit. Now they had triple redundancy, but it really wasn't triple redundancy when we uh, started examining it. It was, uh, it was more like they had one and a half rather than three because the real reason was because they had not given a whole lot of emphasis to what we had commonly uh, referred to as uh, uh, common cause failures. Uh, but uh, that resulted in some real changes in thinking and increasing acceptance on the part of NASA of probabilistic approaches because they were really down on probability that all is rooted back, way back to about 1956 or 7 when GE was asked to do a risk, or a, a, a risk a probability analysis of getting people to the moon and back, and the number they got was very low. Uh, and, they, and that soured the, the agency, and it took a long time to overcome that. Now, interestingly enough, they have a PRA group in headquarters. They happen to be headed by two former nuclear people. And, it's, and, and I'm on a, a National Academy committee right now uh, looking at the risk of, of, of astronauts getting cancer from uh, deep flight, uh, deep space uh, flights. So we're, we're making progress there. So this is what we mean by a success diagram. Uh, and uh, I'm not gonna, if we're not gonna analyze each one, I mainly wanted to point out the process we go through in the, in the development of a, what is called a success uh, diagram and the linearization of the whole facility. Uh, we will talk a little bit about <clears throat> uh, box number six. As, so if we decide we're going to analyze one of the boxes, then we uh, turn up the microscope on that box. In this case, uh oh, I went one too far. In this case, we uh, decided we'd look at the concentration and purification of uranium and pl plutonium nitrates and ask the question, how would we analyze that? Well, this is what we would do. We would linearize it first, and, uh, and what we're talking about here is that uh, in order for the evaporators to perform their intended function, you've, and without the high risk of a red oil incident, first have to make sure that the TBP has been removed, and second, that the evaporator feed analysis that's performed is indeed performed and appropriately acted on. Thirdly, that the evaporator temperature control is keeping the temperatures below uh, the prescribed uh, uh, threshold temperature, maybe 120 degrees, and that the, finally, the evaporator off-gas pressure control is, is at its uh, 
intended levels. And <clears throat> so this is, we, we, uh, we uh, really try to decompose the system uh, into a, a, a point that it's uh, manageable from an analytical standpoint and that it's uh, useful from the standpoint when you're dealing with the people that really understand these, uh, how these things work, that they, they can uh, interpret what we're trying to do. Okay. Step two, identifying, characterize the sources of danger. Well, we can get through this one in a hurry, because here we're only interested in, in radiation, and uh, uh, others are sometimes much more complicated than this. So, all right, what can go wrong scenarios? As I said earlier, this is the, uh, this is the creative part of the work. And this is where we needed the senior reactor operators. This is where you need the senior operators of any chemical plant. And this is where you need to interact with the maintenance people and the designers. But you've got to be careful with the designers because what we found in collecting data from designers, there's a tendency to be a little biased towards the, the reliability of the system. And uh, so uh, how do we go about doing that? Well, uh, we, the, the tool that's been most often used is an inductive logic model or in the form of, a, of an event tree. And so here where we have uh, A, we're really talking about the box that I showed you earlier. Is, uh, the answer is, has the TBP been removed? If the answer is yes, then you go to the right. And if everything is yes, if all the answers are, t are yes, then that represents the success state. And if any of the answers are no, then you go downward into the, into the vertical state. And you can represent any single scenario with a Boolean equation. And the A is that it's successful, and A bar is that it's not successful. Uh, so. This is an enormously useful structure within which to think uh, because we can represent this whole matrix with a simple operator. And, and we can do diagonals on that operator and answer the question, uh, given a certain input state, what's the likelihood of a, a certain output state? And that becomes an extremely useful piece of information. So we don't just calculate the risk. We really create uh, the superstructure or the infrastructure of, of the whole uh, process. Uh, we put some information in this one, and this is, this is my token slide of, that you can't read. Uh, but uh, it, it was, it's done just to kind of illustrate how the process works. And except uh, for uh, the last four, uh, the output state, the damage state, is pretty much a, a, a feed that's off spec and it's very correctable. But, you, but down from S13 uh, to 16, you get into uh, scenarios where you had more than one top event uh, uh, not performing its intended function and you start to get problems like fires and eventually uh, something like an explosion. Or, and, the, and of course, the red oil ex event is simply the distaste that uh, organics and nitrates have for each other, uh, and especially at elevated temperatures. And so if you have a TBP with its diluent, like kerosene or dodecane, uh, and, uh, and urinal nitrate or plutonium nitrate coming together at elevated temperatures, you get a, a degradation that, if uh, uncorrected, uh, creates a lot of uh, uh, gases, non-condensable gases. And uh, the products inc include a lot of, uh, uh, ice, a lot of uh, uh, reaction products that uh, can be very corrosive and sometimes explosive. So this is the type of information that you get out of the scenario. Now, as far as the quantifying the scenario, step four, 
This is the most fun to us that uh, studied applied mathematics and physics and neutron transport and what. Uh, yeah. I have a question. In your inventory, all the knots you have there, there is any uh, condition or probability that happen, all of them supposed to be right, yeah. or, right or wrong? Oh, what you're saying is, uh, we, we're, is it a, is it a binary system? And uh, yes. generally, we you know, yeah. You know, there is a lot of uh, uh, what if, what if, sure. what if you can get out of, out of the box. So sure. Is, no. Yes we, no. Well, the answer, the answer is it depends on what you're looking for and the model. You don't have to have just two states. You can have multiple states. You can have degraded states. You can put that in the event tree as well. Uh, in most cases, what you do is you, you, t you treat all of the uh, conditions under which you can get failure, uh, and that may be multiple states as one state. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's why it's so important to put the time that's needed into de uh, defining the uh, success state. But no, there's no, no restriction on the mathematics. You can, you can, uh, uh, you can put, uh, uh, calibrate, you can calibrate different states and, and, and analytically analyze them. Okay, uh, so what, how do we analyze this? Well, we, we calculate our credibility factor, our probability uh, distribution, uh, at, each pa at each point along the way. In the event tree, you first have to have the uh, uh, probability uh, of uh, the initiating event, and then you have to, at the split fraction or at the branch point, have the probability of it going uh, down rather than across, and so on. And uh, you have to, uh, and the way we usually do this is uh, we, ex we usually adopt frequency as the measure of risk, but we also know that that frequency has uncertainty associated with it. So we put that frequency in a probability distribution, and that's the PDF. Uh, then we need to convolute uh, the event PDFs into scenario PDFs. And that's just uh, probability arithmetic, usually done by Monte Carlo sampling or some other sampling method. And then we have to somehow assemble those results into frequency of exceedance curves. Or the more esoteric label that uh, uh, Mike Vogel used, the complementary cumulative distribution function. Uh, but the complementary cu cumulative distribution function has sort of surfaced as the classic risk curve. Uh, so we go back to our, our event tree. And this sort of illustrates the process. The A, B, C, D correspond to the success uh, boxes that we showed earlier. And we pick any path we want. And of course, what we end up doing is quantifying all the paths. And we can. Uh, but if we pick the highlighted one, then on the lower left there, you see the Boolean expression for that. Uh, and then, of course, the frequency uh, version of that is, follows directly from that. And so now we have a, a, a Boolean equation for the frequency of occurrence of that scenario. And since that end state of that scenario is the damage state, we also have the of frequency equation for that, for that damage state. Uh, and uh, we will, in a few moments, uh, say, uh, go, uh, talk about what the next step is after you get the Boolean expression. Uh, but uh, if you pick one of the branch points, what you usually then do is uh, another type of diagram uh, in this case, it was a fault tree, uh, is used most often, although it, not always, uh, to quantify the branch point. So the branch point that says feed analysis fails to prevent TBP in the evaporator field, uh, well, that can happen only if analysis fails to detect the TBP or uh, the operator fails to send the uh, feed uh, back, so to speak. 
And then you can kind of work your way down. The diamonds tend to indicate that it needs further development. Uh, the basic events are usually denoted by the, by the circles. And of course, you have transfer points. Some part of your fault tree down below may be applicable to, uh, uh, with respect to a feedback uh, loop. And so we, here's uh, the one for the evaporator temperature control. Uh, you know, the whole issue is a, a race between the evolution of heat and the dispersion of heat. And uh, if, you, if you don't keep ahead of that race, then you do get the formation of gases and pressure and ultimately a, poss uh, a possible explosion. <clears throat> okay, now back to the quantification. Uh, this is basically probability arithmetic. So the, the, uh, the path that we had I highlighted is illustrated here. We started out with our uh, scenario Boolean equation and we transformed that into the frequency of equation. And then we, on the basis of uh, all the supporting evidence that we could get and keeping up with it through Bayes' theorem, we developed the probability density functions for each of the uh, branch points and the initiating condition or initiating event. And it's based on whatever evidence you can find. And that evidence doesn't just include uh, failure rates, because sometimes you don't have much going for you there, but it's expert judgment and uh, experience and what, whatever is, seems to be uh, relevant. OK, the next step is uh, the steps five and six, because I, it, my only purpose here was to illustrate the process not to share with you a comprehensive analysis. If you uh, want to go on West Valley's website and see an analysis of how this was applied to uh, uh, a waste disposal facility, uh, that's easy to do. Uh, we've, it's about a 700-page uh, study that was done in three months. Uh, and I remember my colleague at uh, Sandia couldn't believe it when he, he, he was a reviewer of it, he was astonished that uh, what we were able to do. I, and I think that's primarily because we uh, have been doing it for a long, long time and for all manner of things. We even uh, analyzed the, uh, the risk of, you know, of a pickle factory being successful in, in uh, uh, being able to uh, uh, a generator produce a certain quality of pickle. Uh, my colleague, Stan Kaplan, uh, worked for two or three years with the uh, Department of Agriculture to bring this technology into the uh, food, food uh, quality business. So <clears throat> I'm about done here. Uh, so these are the two principal uh, displays that are, you'll find if it's a quantitative risk assessment. And what I mean by that, if it's a risk assessment that embraces the concepts of uncert the uncertainty sciences. Uh, if it's a specific event, like a specific level of damage or a uh, specific dose, uh, the PDF is the, the way to do it. And all this portrays is that if the area under the curve that's cross-hatched is 90% of the area, then what that curve tells us is that we are 90% confident that the frequency of occurrence of that event is between phi1 and phi2. Uh, as to the integration process and the accumulation process, we go to a different kind of structure. And that one is achieved by taking all the PDFs of the, all the scenarios and accumulating them from the bottom to the top. You first, you have to arrange them in order of increasing damage and create what we referred to earlier as the frequency of exceedance curve. Now, this is a very useful curve. And it took us a long time to get the WIP uh, uh, format uh, in, in, in this way. And we even had some trouble in the early days of getting Yucca Mountain. And, uh, 
I was in two different capacities. In WHIP, I was uh, on the National Academies Committee on WHIP and for a, t a time chair of it. And in the case of uh, uh, the uh, Yucca Mountain, uh, my whipping platform was the board, board on, uh, the uh, Nuclear Waste Technical Review, Review Board, which is a presidentially appointed board and which I currently chair. But this curve really uh, is uh, a powerful piece of information. Uh, this one is useful with respect to uh, individual scenarios. Uh, and then there's a whole raft of other things that go with these results, the most important of which is the importance ranking of all the contributors to the risk. That is really turns out to be, and that was just enormous eye-opener in a lot of these facilities, and, and including uh, nuclear power plants. So I think that's about all I ha have that I want to cover. Uh, I have the usual conclusion side, which says nothing much. Uh, but uh, the, the, the business has uh, matured, uh, both uh, uh, from the standpoint of, of the government's use of, of PRA and its extensions of the uh, WASH 1400, the Rasmussen Report. By the way, Rasmussen was uh, one of our board members on our on my company. I didn't say anything about my company, but I had a company from uh, the early 70s until I sold it in 1997. Uh, and that little company uh, had something to do with every nuclear plant in this country. Sometimes it was a very small uh, thing, but we were heavily involved. So we, were, we didn't do any government work until much later. Uh, NASA broke the ice, they came to us, and uh, then we've, in the waste field, it's been pretty much all government. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any